But we start with the unworldly presence of Peter Capaldi. Currently best known as Doctor Who, he's no stranger to being a cult TV star since playing the foul-mouthed spin doctor Malcolm Tucker in The Thick of It. But having grown up as a huge Doctor Who and fantasy film fan, like the show's outgoing producer Stephen Moffat, it is perhaps no surprise that this year's Christmas special celebrates childhood pleasures as the Doctor encounters a good-hearted superhero called the Ghost in New York and first a plucky reporter on the trail of a villain. Who are you? Lucy Fletcher, reporter from the Daily Chronicle. Hang on! Why am I telling you the truth? It's spooky, isn't it? Looking for a story. I think I just found one. Brains with minds of their own. Don't believe that. This is America. Who are you? Special Agent Dan. Dangerous from Scotland Yard. Scotland. The Doctor, for short. See, they've got institutes all over the world. They're always in capital cities. Nope. Yes. Yes, they are. See? New York's not a capital city, is it? You don't need to point out the mistakes. That's not what you're for. Peter Capaldi, Matt Lucas and Charity Wakefield in the Doctor Who Christmas special, The Return of Doctor Mysterio. When he came into the front row studio a little earlier, I asked Peter Capaldi whether the superhero character, the ghost, was a deliberate nod to the current popularity of superhero films. I think it's more of a nod to the older kind of superhero. When I say that, I mean the Christopher Reeve sort of men in tights kind of superheroes who are more naive. Nowadays, superheroes seem to be very knowing and rather dark and tend to be involved in films with orgies of CGI destruction (laughs) at the end. Our hero, the ghost, is perhaps a little more of an echo uh, of of Art Kent. He's profoundly attached to the idea of justice and fairness and kindness Uh, And so the real world troubles him a bit, (laughs) rather like the Doctor. I also gather in the title, too, there's a a deliberate reference to what Doctor Who's called in Mexico. Yes. One of the things about Doctor Who which you don't quite realise is how popular it is around the world. And held in deep, deep affection. And we think of it as such a British thing. I mean, it's very, very popular in Latin America, particularly in Mexico. And I was surprised when we went there because... They've actually had it since the 60s. And they showed me when I was there a clip of William Hartnell, who was the very first Doctor Who, speaking in uh, Spanish-Mexican. Dubbed. And they showed me the start of the show, which has the music, and the title Doctor Who comes up, but they dub a voice on it which says, Doctor Mysterio. (laughs) And that's what they call it, Doctor Mysterio. And I thought, what a fantastic name that is. I gather um, from what Stephen Moffat has said, actually, getting you to say it was a big part of why they called it that. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I like saying it a lot. You've like just saying, demonstrated exactly why. I like saying why. Dr Mysterio. Uh, but, yeah, that's what they call it, and, and they love it. I mean, the, the, the affection for the show out there is... It's immense. You'll know that there's a huge kind of weight of expectation around the Christmas special. How would you sum up what you've tried to do with this one? It's very funny, this episode, and it's quite moving in its own way. And I think that's the right kind of um, components to have in a festive Doctor Who. It's nostalgic. People are able to plug into their own relationship with the show, even if they don't watch the series. I think on Christmas Day they like to have a little look and they can remember Doctor Who from their youth and they can see whether or not it it, it tallies up with what they saw when they were young. You've touched on that whole dilemma for Doctor Who, which is the balance between the nostalgic adult fans who grew up with it, for whom it's a touchstone to their childhood, and the need to attract new fans and all those children who've grown up with it over the last 15 years. Um, How difficult is that and how do you see your role in holding that together? Something that you always have to remember about Doctor Who is that the constituency of the audience is hugely varied. It is a show that plays very successfully to seven-year-olds and 77-year-olds and every age range in between, whether it be teenagers or hipsters or middle-aged men who should know better. You know, you've got to play to all of those people. So sometimes we deal with metaphysical issues, we deal with philosophical issues, grief issues, but we also got to blow up monsters and trip up over things and do funny things um, for children. And it would be wrong of us not to do that. Um, So balancing all of those things is hard because your instincts as an actor are often, or particularly my instincts as an actor, tend to be to cleave towards reality uh, and truisms. But then suddenly in Doctor Who you have to spin very quickly and do an almost pantomimic thing. You can't just be 
a serious metaphysical stranger from outer space. You also have to be a clown and a hero uh, and a fool. I also was thinking, because you had been in the position of being potentially considered some years back when they were making the TV film yeah. that went to, to Paul McGann, and then it turned out Stephen Moffat had considered you uh-huh. um, earlier before uh-huh. you were actually offered the role. I wonder if, when you finally took it, it's been three years now, how, yeah. how it feels? Do you feel entirely happy? Is it, has it turned out to be a burden in any way? Um, no. I think it's a delight. It's a privilege. It's a strange position to be in. I mean, I think being famous is quite strange. Some people take to it more easily than others. I mean, you know, I was sort of very happy with my life the way it was. So to have this added level of visibility um, was quite strange. I'm glad it happened to me, you know, at this age. I think it must be very difficult when you're young to suddenly be the centre of attention and be looked after. Uh, I, because I'm older, know that that will pass. Whereas I think if you were younger, you might think, oh, that is how life will be now. But you've also had the experience of being a kind of cult TV figure through Malcolm Tucker and the thick of it. Yeah, and Malcolm was amazing, you know, because I guess that was the first time that I'd experienced kind of fame of that level. It's not the same thing as Doctor Who. It's not the same scale. Same intensity. Not the same as intensity. And people would stop me in the street and say, can you swear at me? And (laughs) can you say terrible things to me? And I would tell them to get a life, and, but with much more colourful language. Um, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> it's no secret, of course, that you were such a huge fan, particularly of Doctor Who, but of science fiction as a teenager. And I remember yeah. reading about how you wished when you'd been a teenager it had been cool then to be a geek. and You'd burned yeah. a lot of your memorabilia, your signed autographs and things from Peter Cushing. Yeah. Um, I wonder how that's affected your relationship with the fans. I mean, I came from Glasgow, and I think I was always always a very arty child, but that wasn't a really sort of popular... Um, you know, people who played football didn't like you if you were arty. You know, you couldn't get on the football team and all that stuff. So the whole thing of being involved in sci-fi and horror, I loved horror movies and all that stuff, it was just, it was a fantastical, wonderful thing. It was full of other worlds and, and interesting characters. We know that Stephen Moffat is leaving as showrunner. Yeah. And certainly fans, you know, worry about continuity. Do you feel a special responsibility for fans to stay on, that you are that continuity? Um, Yeah, I feel a responsibility to the show and to the character. But part of that responsibility is understanding when it's time to leave it. I've never done a television programme that is so demanding of of your time. And it's fantastic. But every day you have to find a new way to do this line or that line or whatever. So I don't want to get into this situation where I'm just uh, just going through the motions. You know, but to be honest, I just avoid making the decision. I mean, I've been asked to stay on and I just haven't, you know, you know, come to a decision about it because I don't want to have to sit in a room and make that decision. Not only have you played the Doctor and Malcolm Tucker and had all these great roles, you won an Oscar for your short film, uh, yeah. Franz Kafka's It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. One wonders what new goals you might have set yourself for your career? Oh, I really want to do a lot of things. I mean, I think I'd like to be more edgier and stranger. And do, um, you're <laughs> laughing at me. Am I edgy and strange in the first place? Is that you what? do so much wonderful, edgy, strange stuff. Oh, really? Stuff. Yeah, oh, well, that's a, that's a comfort. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? A lot of it, I mean, Doctor Who is very mainstream, you know. So in a way, there are whole areas of, whether it be in the theatre or, or in film and television that I'd, I'd like to explore that are more um, esoteric. Peter Capaldi. The Doctor Who Christmas special, The Return of Doctor Mysterio, is on BBC One at 5.45 on Christmas Day.